A little while back, I started an OnlyFans account. I know what you're all thinking, but hey, I was single at the time, and I figured it was a pretty harmless way to earn a little extra dough. I started off by posting some tame stuff, and progressively got into uploading more mature images. Yeah, I'm not proud of it, but I'm not ashamed either. I lived with my parents at the time, so I had to be careful about making my content. Like I said, I wasn't ashamed, but I knew they wouldn't be as open-minded about it. As such, I always waited until they were out of the house before I took any pictures or videos, and I didn't tell any of my friends out of fear that it would somehow get back to my folks. It was very private business. After just a few months, I couldn't believe how much money I was making on the site. I'd amassed a sizable following and monthly income, so I decided to treat myself. My wardrobe was pretty old at that point, and I decided to buy some new clothes. I hit up a local store to pick out some new outfits. Now, it might sound strange to some of you, but when I got to the store, I started live streaming to my OnlyFans followers, talking to them about changing up my style and asking for their opinions on certain items. I'd often stream to my supporters through my private, but fans only YouTube channel during the day. I thought this built a sense of community. A lot of them enjoyed seeing me go about my life, whether I was just out shopping, at a cafe, or just blogging from my apartment, and I'd reply to their comments and connect with them. For the most part, they were well behaved and respectful during those streams, and I started recognizing a few of their names. It was pretty wholesome. I made my way through the store, holding the camera in selfie mode, engaging with my fans. After about 20 minutes or so, I ended the stream. At some point during that evening, I logged onto my page. That's when I noticed a message from one of my regulars. Thanks for wasting our time and money by lying to all of us. You never told us you had a boyfriend. Consider this the end of my support. I was confused. Boyfriend? Where'd he get that idea? Well, this guy was one of my biggest supporters, and I was really sorry to see him go. So, naturally, I sent him a message. Uh, hey. I am single. Free as a bird. I don't know who told you I wasn't. Do you think I'm stupid or something? I'll admit it took me a couple of months to notice, but it's obvious you're with some guy all the time. I see him in the background of all of your streams. He was with you at the store today. What are you talking about? The dude in the green shirt. I feel really sorry for the guy to be honest, dating someone who does what you do. I went back to check the recording of that day's stream, and sure enough, about five minutes in, over my left shoulder, there was a guy in a green shirt, walking quite close behind me. He was very tall, had a muscular build, looked to be in his late twenties, but already had dark circles under his eyes and thinning hair. Okay, well that didn't prove anything, just some guy behind me at the store. I continued watching the video, and yeah, the guy did seem to be behind me for most of it, popping up throughout as if he was following me, but surely that was just a coincidence. Still, my regular's message stayed in my mind. He said he'd seen this guy in multiple streams of mine. I went back and checked the previous stream that I'd done. It was of me at the mall. Nothing seemed out of place. Then I saw him. That same guy in that same green shirt, walking behind me in the distance. That stream had lasted 47 minutes, and you could see him behind me throughout it. Sometimes far, sometimes close, but always following me. The stream ended with me at a cafe and the guy sitting down, just a couple of tables away from me, all by his lonesome. The whole time, his dark eyes were watching me. I hadn't noticed him at all. Okay, so I started getting a little freaked out at this point. Obviously, this wasn't just a coincidence. I went back and checked more of my older streams. Videos of me in town, videos of me walking the dog at the park, chilling on the beach. In all of them, he was there and in almost all of them, he was wearing the same green shirt. This man, who I had never seen before in my life, had been following me on what appeared to be a daily basis. He wasn't a part of my life, but I was clearly a big part of his. I wasn't sure what to do at first. He had never approached me or anything. My dad was in law enforcement, but I couldn't exactly go to him for advice. I decided to stop posting content on my account for a while resolving to stay alert and keep an eye out for this guy, and just wait for everything to blow over. If things escalated, then I'd go and tell my pa. 
I figured this guy would get bored and leave me alone. Boy, how naive I was. A couple of weeks passed, and luckily I hadn't seen the green shirt guy around town. Guess my plan had worked. My fans were getting antsy about me not uploading new content, and my earnings were going down as a result. One weekend, my parents went off on a romantic getaway, and hoping to ride the OnlyFans wave a little longer, I decided to take some new photos in my bedroom. Since I was home alone, there was no risk of being caught. That night, I cooked up some dinner in the kitchen, opened the window to wear it out, and then went upstairs to snap the goods. After uploading the pictures, I started a live stream to apologize to my followers for my long absence. I told them it was back to business as usual. The salty dinner had made me thirsty, so during that live stream, I went downstairs to grab my water bottle in the living room, bringing my phone with me so I could continue interacting with my viewers. I was holding my phone out in front of me, completely oblivious to my surroundings, responding to my viewers' comments. I got to one. As soon as I read it, my stomach dropped. Hey, Mellow Cat, who's the man at your window? In the video feed on my phone, in the corner of the screen, I noticed the small, blurry outline of a figure in the darkness behind me. I turned to see the man, the one who had been following me, standing outside, his gloved hands pressed up against the living room window, his face real close as he looked in at me his dark eyes wide with excitement. I screamed and ran upstairs with my phone in my hand. I bounded into the bathroom and locked the door behind me as I called my parents. I cried to my dad that there was some guy outside our house, told him that he'd been following me for a long time. He said that they were on their way back right now, not to panic, and that my mum was already calling the cops. We didn't have any neighbours to call for help since we lived in such an isolated area. So he instructed me to run to the attic and to keep as quiet as possible until help arrived. I did as he suggested and unlocked the bathroom door. As I stepped out, I could hear quiet movements coming from the kitchen below. That's when I remembered. I had left the window open. And this guy was inside my house. The access to the attic was in my parents' room, and I could already hear the guy softly calling out to me downstairs. Hello? Mellow Cat? Where are you? He was calling to me, using my OnlyFans username. I sprinted into my parents' room and slammed the door behind me, and as I went to lock it, could hear the guy storming up my stairs. Luckily, locking the door gave me just enough time to pull down the attic's ladder and scamper up with the hook in my hand. As I climbed up, I could hear the man on the other side of the door, thumping into it with all of his body weight. I pulled the ladder back up and closed the attic hatch behind me. I waited up there with my hand over my mouth as I heard the door give way. My heart was beating so fast I couldn't stop breathing heavily. Things were being thrown around and smashed in the room beneath me. All I could do was listen as the guy rampaged through my house, occasionally shouting obscenities and saying that he knew I was still in the house. This torment didn't last long, maybe only five minutes tops but I felt like I was up in that attic for an eternity. The house fell silent, but I stayed up there until I heard the police sirens come rolling into our driveway. My parents weren't far behind them. During their investigation, the detectives dusted the fingerprints on the door handles. There weren't any, but there was something else. They found traces of trichloromethane. Chloroform. It must have come off a rag or off his gloved hands. The only thing missing from our house was my laptop, which had a bunch of photos of me that I hadn't released online. And this guy had clearly come for the real thing, but seeing how I climbed to safety, he settled for images instead. I haven't posted anything online since, and didn't even log on to tell my followers goodbye, since I knew that he was among them. So, in the end, I came clean to my parents about what I'd been doing and moved in with my sister in a different town for my own safety. I won't say where, for obvious reasons, as Greenshirt himself could be listening. Yeah, despite having relatively clear images of the guy's face, and knowing that he must have been from the local area and one of my followers, they never found the guy. I have no idea how he got my address. I'm just thankful I went downstairs when I did.
and my viewer caught the shadowy figure outside my window. Had that guy come in while I was streaming upstairs, I might not have heard him, and who knows if I'd still be here to share this story. At the time, I was 21 years old and totally broke. I worked for a consultancy firm that wasn't a big player there or anything. In fact, I was pretty much at the bottom of the company totem pole. I earned enough money to get by, but always had dreams of traveling to another country and studying abroad. If I was ever going to make that dream a reality, I needed another source of income. It was around that time that OnlyFans started blowing up. For the two people listening who don't know what that is, OnlyFans is a website where people, mostly women, share pictures and videos with paying subscribers. This is usually, uh, mature content. It's pretty controversial, with some people being all for the platform, and others saying it's sleazy and gross. I'd heard a few stories about women making fat stacks from the comfort of their own homes, and even though I'm no Belle Delphine, I figured, yeah, what the hell, maybe I can earn a few extra bucks too. I made an account, and recorded a little intro message for any prospective followers. Then I took my first raunchy pictures and uploaded them. I'd casted out my net, now I just had to wait for a few fish to come swimming by. After a few weeks, I'd attracted a few followers, all of whom were subscribed for $10 a month. Some of them even gave me tips, or paid me extra for exclusive content. I made a promise to myself that whatever money I earned through the site would go directly into my travel fund, and as soon as I had enough money to go globetrotting, I'd stop using the platform altogether. In the meantime, I had a lot of work to do at my real job. One afternoon, I was at a business conference, networking alongside my co-workers. Where I live, business cards are still a formality, even for low-level grunts like me, and I handed out dozens to prospective clients who seemed interested in working with our company. Honestly, I met so many new people that day, all of them in similar suits and with similar haircuts, that all of their faces and names seemed to blur together in my memory. I returned home, exhausted from the socializing. That evening before bed, I logged into my OnlyFans account to check how things were going. Oh, great, I had a new subscriber. This new guy, who went by the unassuming username, John Smith, sent me a direct message as soon as he saw I was active. Ten bucks a month? Netflix doesn't even charge that. It's worth it, you won't be disappointed. So far I like what I'm seeing. You're very beautiful. Oh, thank you so much. He sent me a few more friendly messages, asking me pretty innocent questions, like if I had a dog. I didn't. If I was dating anyone. I wasn't. And if I lived with my parents. I lived with a roommate who was away that week. You know, you really are very beautiful, he messaged me. Thank you. I bet you get down more often than a blow-up doll, right? Oh, <laughs> can I make a request? Like a picture request? It depends what it is and what you tip me. If I give you five bucks right now, would you take a picture of yourself pouting into the camera? Well, it had been a long day, but even though I was tired, I wanted the money. So I quickly dolled myself up and took the picture for the guy. I sent the picture, which he could unlock for five dollars. He unlocked it and seemed pleased with what I'd sent. No more than a minute later, he sent me another request. How about one of your pretty feet now? I'll pay you another five. Sure, whatever you want. I'll never get what's up with some guys and feet, but of course I took the picture for him and sent it, again behind a five dollar paywall. He made a couple more requests, each time paying me five bucks. Easy money, I thought. One of me in high heels, one of me in such and such a position, etc. Then, he sent me another request, this time for ten dollars. Add me on Instagram. He included his account name in the message. Ten bucks just to add a guy on Instagram? Sure, why not? I hadn't updated my Insta for over a year, and only had a couple of posts on there anyway. I took his ten dollars and added him. Strange, there weren't any posts on his account, but the circle around his blank profile picture was highlighted meaning he had recently added to his Instagram story. Just out of curiosity, I clicked on it to see what he had posted. It was a video of my house. 
posted two hours ago, taken from the woods just outside. The next story played, uploaded five minutes ago. It was another video of my house, this time much closer, taken from the other side of the street. The video zoomed in on my bedroom window, the only room where the light was on, the room I was in. The third story, uploaded just two minutes ago, was taken from just outside my porch window. He was right outside my front door, filming the inside of my house through the glass. A message popped up in my DMs. Let me in. Terrified, I locked my bedroom door immediately and called the police, telling them that someone was outside my house. All the while, he continued DMing me. Come outside, or I'll have to come in. The door handle downstairs started rattling as I cowered in fear upstairs, waiting hopelessly for help to arrive, screaming out of my bedroom window for help. This wasn't the best neighborhood, let's put it like that, and my neighbors either couldn't hear me or didn't want to help. The guys rattling on the door handle turned into banging, then slamming. Suddenly, everything downstairs fell silent. I thought he had gone, but after a few minutes, I could hear tapping on the downstairs windows, and shortly after that, the smashing of glass. I'd soon learn that he had used a rock to smash the living room window. Not thirty seconds later, I could hear sirens off in the distance. By the time an officer arrived to check that I was okay, the guy was long gone. I told the investigators everything. They patrolled the area to look for any suspicious looking guys, found nobody and suggested I stay somewhere else for a while. I asked them to hang around while I packed a bag. As I got in my car to drive to my parents' place, I checked my phone one last time. There was one unread message in my OnlyFans DM box. Pleasure doing business with you. I told my parents everything that had happened and tried my best to get some sleep. That night, I was plagued with questions. Who was John Smith? What was he planning on doing? How did he know where I lived? My private information was of course not available on OnlyFans. I was relatively new to town and didn't know many people in the area. The next day I pieced two and two together. My business card. It didn't just have my company address on, but mine as well. The fact this happened the night after that networking event couldn't have been a coincidence. I'm convinced that the creep was one of the people I'd met that day. Using the information on the card, he must have found my account online and decided to pay me a visit. I passed that information along to the authorities, along with the dozens of business cards I collected that day. This of course resulted in nothing. There was no evidence to speak of, and the Insta account was obviously a throwaway. I realize now that he was asking me those friendly questions at the start to see if I lived alone, and to check I didn't have a guard dog. Needless to say, I quit using the site. I've moved back in with my parents permanently now, but can't afford to give up my job at the consultancy firm. Now, whenever I go into work and meet with our clients, I put on a brave face. But inside, I'm always questioning whether the guy I'm working with is the same one who was outside my house that night. I hardly like to remember the first and last time I ever took an Uber, as it was a fairly traumatic experience. I had just finished an 11 hour shift and I hadn't hardly gotten any sleep the night before. Even if I had a vehicle at that time, I'm not sure I would have chosen to drive myself home, just because of my level of exhaustion. Usually I took a taxi home, but either the ones that drove past me that day didn't want to drive me, or they were all taken. So I chose to use Uber since my friends both raved so hard about it practically preaching as if it was their own personal religion. Well, in every good few experiences there's a bad one, and this is where mine begins. Once my Uber arrived, I noticed it had no back license plate, but I didn't think much about it because to be quite honest, I was a blink away from passing out onto the pavement, so of course, I didn't think anything on it. The moment I sat in the vehicle, I noticed how clean and impeccable everything was especially compared to most of the taxis I had taken in my life. 
Another thing I noticed was how the man in the front seat never so much as took a glance in my direction. He even just sat there for a minute in complete and utter silence, unmoving. After that minute, I began to think that I had somehow gotten into the wrong vehicle and apologized. But once I did, the car started moving, so I relaxed a bit, assuming he may have just been waiting for a moment to get back into traffic. The last thing I remembered was watching the bustling downtown area going about its business until my eyes finally chose to flutter shut and send me into a blissful sleep. I wake up once the car hits a large pothole in the road, causing me to whack my head onto the window fairly hard. The first thing that alerted me to something being wrong was the fact that it was super dark out. When I entered the Uber, it was at least 3 p.m. It doesn't get dark this time of year till at least 4 or 5 at night. On top of that, the highway in which I didn't recognize was practically dead, which that in itself was a rarity so I couldn't even begin to comprehend how long I had actually been out for. As I glanced out the window, I felt my heart sink into the pit of my stomach slightly. We were no longer inside the city. Instead, we were on a pitch black highway surrounded by dense forest, and I didn't live anywhere outside of the city. I quickly began to feel the tingling sensation of eyes on me, causing me to turn my head to the empty seat beside me. Except, it was no longer empty. It was nearly too dark to see, but I was able to make out the shape of a dark, lanky figure seated beside me. The only part of his face were lit up by the dim dash lights, were his insanely wide eyes staring at me intensely. The way he looked at me gave me a sense of complete and utter panic. I was in a situation that I never thought could happen to me. It was something that happened to other people, but never me. Do you happen to know if we're close to my destination? I questioned, trying to sound as calm as possible. Then the man beside me continued to stare at me longer than any sane person would be comfortable with. He has other plans for you. A new destination. We're almost there. The man beside me stated in an unsettling tone. At this point, I was sure the man hadn't blinked a single time since I had woken up. The man's words quickly sent my already present panic into overdrive. The car was going nearly 100 miles per hour on the highway. In the middle of the night... My mind began to race as fast as the vehicle, grasping at any faint idea I could use to get me out of the car or out of the situation. If I jumped out of the vehicle and somehow didn't break any bones or end up dead, they wouldn't easily find me on the road. Plus, I had no clue where I even was. I have to go to the bathroom. Could we maybe make a quick stop? I said. The two men simply stayed quiet, practically ignoring my question although it hardly seemed as though they had even heard me at all. The others will welcome you once he is done. He will welcome you. The man in the front seat finally spoke deeply, the vibrato and the intent in his voice shaking me to the core. That moment, a single vehicle finally drove past us. The light that filled the car was enough to help me see my surroundings better, giving me a moment to get a more clear look at the second passenger. The man beside me had fresh stitches all over his face. His top eyelids were stuck open, making his constant wide eyes more understandable, but no less unsettling. His entire face was almost like some sick sewing project, almost reminiscent of Frankenstein, but confined to the head rather than the entire body. You came to us for a reason. You will be pleased to make you like me, like us. The man beside me said, beginning to stroke my hair and touch the features of my face. I began to shake under the stranger's touch as well as his words. His fingers were rough and disconcertingly dry. The sound of sirens from behind us let an overbearing rush of relief wash over me, but there was also an almost uncomfortable tension that fell upon the air. It felt as if something within the air was taut and ready to snap at any moment, as if the slightest provocation or wrong movement could cause it to blow. Do you folks know why I pulled you over? The police officer questioned once he reached the car. No, sir, I don't believe I do. The man in the driver's seat said in a flat manner. Well, for starters, you were going nearly 50 over the speed limit. That, of course, isn't a huge deal, as it is the highway. And it's not very busy right now. But both of your headlights are burnt out, and that's way too dangerous for the road. I'm surprised I even caught you it was so dark. The officer stated calmly, tapping his fingers against the car as he stared into the dark vehicle. The moment his eyes made contact with my own, I tried as hard as possible to convey my fear, to slightly plead for help without aggravating the two men in some way. I thought I recognized you. There's a warrant out for your arrest. I'm afraid I'll have to take you in, the cop says sternly, singling me out. 
the men around me didn't seem to clue into the fact that he was talking to me as I saw them both tense up at his words. The moment the police officer opened the passenger door beside me, I nearly began crying out in relief, but I refrained. The men behind me stayed uncomfortably quiet as the cop locked the cuffs on me. The now overly acquainted sense of unease and panic continued to fuel me. The men beside me stayed uncomfortably quiet as the cop locked the cuffs on me. The now overly acquainted sense of unease and panic continued to the now overly acquainted sense of unease and panic continued to fill me as I felt the man's eyes bore into my back. It felt like at any moment my chance at freedom would be taken away, that they would be armed and shoot my savior or even me. But they didn't either. Instead, they sat there within the car quietly, just staring at us in a horrific trance-like state. Even as the cop began to drive away, I somehow felt their cold and unnerving stares upon my skin, the air still thick with tension. And no matter how far away we got, their car never moved so much as an inch, which made my feeling even more so stressed than before, if that was even possible. How'd you know I needed help? I'm a cop. I could recognize the look in your eyes from a mile away. I see it daily. He stated. Within seconds, I began breaking down in tears. Every emotion suddenly overwhelmed me. The man didn't say another word the whole entire ride. He simply let me cry it out. He even offered to watch my house for the night in case they came back, as I had given them my address. I, of course, said yes, even though I didn't sleep a wink that night. They never came back. The thought sickens and terrifies me. Maybe they never even left that spot on the highway. If that hellish car had never gotten pulled over, I don't even want to know what would have happened. I wouldn't have got my chance to escape that horrible situation I'd found myself in. Be careful if you take an Uber or any other service like it. And no matter how tired you are, don't fall asleep in the vehicle. Uber Nightmare It was another night on the job. Not that I liked nights on the job, but my rent was due in a week and I already spent the money I had on new tires and an oil change for my car. I knew that was no excuse for my landlord, who told me last month, If you're late on your rent again, I'll make sure you're gone. Yeah, she wasn't big on leniency. In any case, I've spent every night chauffeuring around kids, workaholics, and drunks for the abysmal wage Uber will give me. I couldn't be kicked out onto the streets. It's not like I had family around since I moved to this quiet coastal town a few months ago. I haven't really made any friends here either. So, into the night, I drove. I hated driving around at night. It gave me the creeps. Because it was close to the water, there was always this ominous dew that blanketed the sky. Imagine that drive down a foggy bridge. You know, the one where you didn't dare look back through the rearview mirror. Anyway, I just dropped off this inebriated couple from a bar. When my next picked up pinged my phone, I thought to myself, that was fast. But it was late. Probably just another person leaving the bar as last call I'd surely passed. As I drove to pick up my next passenger, I noticed that this person is exactly where I picked up the couple a uh, half hour earlier. At this time, it didn't strike me as too strange. It was more of just a weird coincidence. I shrugged it off rather quickly. As I approached, I didn't see anybody, and there seemed to be an extra layer of fog. I honked and looked to see if anybody was walking up, but I didn't see anything. I averted my eyes to my phone to double check the pickup location. No, I was in the right. The rear driver door suddenly opened. My heart was definitely close to leaping out of my chest. Uh, <clears throat> hello there. You scared the hell out of me. I laughed. I was even a little embarrassed. It was a heavyset guy who didn't say anything as he stepped in and sat. I looked back at him briefly. He was clutching a brown paper bag. He put it beside him, keeping it close. Then he looked at me with a blank stare. I turned back around quickly. It says you want to be dropped off just a block away? Was there a mistake? I mean, no problem. Uh, I just want to make sure it wasn't a mistake. Finally, the guy spoke. His voice was low and harsh. Must be a mistake. He paused. Was he going to say something else? Did I not hear something he said? I'm with the couple that you just picked up. Oh, really? I asked instinctively. They wanted to ride separately. He said, matter-of-factly. Then, I remembered that the couple was making out, and they were surely drunk. So I guess it did make sense for them to ride alone. Still, it just seemed so strange. So, I'm taking you to the same place I took them then, I asked. He just grunted. 
I felt like something was off, but I have to admit, I was too freaked out to question anything. So, I put their address in, put the car in gear, and drove off. Every so often, I glanced at the brown paper bag the guy had next to him. I didn't want to be obvious, but I wondered if there was maybe a beer in the bag, maybe some snacks. I even began to wonder if there was a weapon of some sort inside. Maybe I was just being paranoid. Then my phone sounded and I almost jumped. I had a notification from Uber that there was someone else that wanted to be picked up along the way. That was weird since it was already past 3 in the morning. It didn't bother me though. I was just relieved to have someone else join us. I started getting more and more on edge with this strange guy sitting behind me. We got to the location of the other passenger. and She was standing under a street light. Easy to find this time. Already an upgrade from my last pickup. This girl was bundled up quite a bit so it was hard to get a good look at her. She slowly jogged up to the passenger side of my car, which I'd usually advise the person to sit in the back, but given this guy back there, I decided to not put her in that situation. She opened the door and got in quickly. Hello, late night, huh? She looked at me and her eyes seemed ice cold. It was unnerving. She smiled and looked out ahead. I brushed it off and looked to see where she was being dropped off at. And it was the same address the couple was dropped off at the same address I was taking this guy. I looked at her and asked, so you all know each other? She looked back at the guy and then smiled. She then looked at me and said confidently, yep. I swallowed the spit that had been welling up in my mouth and shut up for the rest of the drive. I was sure something was wrong, but there was nothing I could do at this point. My best bet was to just drop them off and go home. We were just minutes away, then all this would be over. As we pulled up to the address, I noticed all the lights were off. Great. The guy got out first and began walking towards the house. Then the girl got out. Before she closed the door, she looked back and said, You just have to wait a minute. We're dropping off something they forgot. We'll be right back. She smiled and waited to hear how I was going to respond. Uh, yeah, of course. Now, why the hell did I say that? She shut the door and went to follow the guy. I looked on at them. It was so dark... I even lost sight of them. Then I looked ahead and sat there for a few minutes. Should I just leave? I thought to myself. Before I could even entertain the thought, the girl's hand slammed on the passenger window. She opened the door and exclaimed, Please hurry quick! My friend needs help! My jaw dropped. I knew something bad was happening. Something just didn't feel right. I sat there frozen. Hurry! There's blood! We need your help to get her to the hospital! She continued. I tried to push the fear out of the back of my mind and got out of the car to follow her. I followed closely as we neared the front door. When we got just inside the door, I stopped and was going to make a run for it back to my car. But the door slammed before I could step out. The guy was standing there and shoved me to the ground. He had a blood-soaked knife in his hands. The girl slowly turned to me and told me to run while laughing maniacally. Still, on the ground, I crawled as fast as I could to the next room. It was the house's dining room. I couldn't believe my eyes. The couple I had driven home about an hour ago were sitting at the table. Both sat there dead, with multiple stab wounds. As I continued to crawl, my hands and knees became soaked with their blood. I tried to cry out, but my shock would not let me. The guy was behind me now, though I couldn't see the girl. I stood up and tried to see if I could make it to the staircase in the next room. Audibly screaming at this point, I darted and could feel the guy dart after me. I glanced back and by a stroke of luck saw the guy slip on their blood. I ran even faster up the stairs. The girl's voice started laughing again, but this time from somewhere I couldn't see. One of the upstairs bedroom's door was open, so I jumped in and shoved myself in the closet. Hopeless and terrified, I cried into my hands, smearing blood across my hair and face. I was a dead man and we all knew it. I couldn't hear anything at first, then there were loud heavy footsteps coming up the stairs. I tried to quiet my sobs as if that was going to do anything. It was only a matter of time. Police sirens filled my ears. The neighbors must have heard it and called it in. Those footsteps coming up began rushing back down the stairs and out a door. When I was sure the coast was clear, I stepped out of the closet and fell to my knees. All of the sirens were stationary now and it was clear the police were about to storm in was saved. Somehow, I became the survivor of the worst Uber ride of my life. They never did catch those two maniacs, however, and since that night, four other couples have turned up dead.
We all need to stop using TikTok and Zoom right now. I'm an avid TikTok user, but I mainly just watch other people's videos. The other day, a TikTok showed up on my feed of a time lapse of a child aging from being a baby to being 10 years old with the caption, time flies. It was late, so I watched it with one eye open as I felt myself drifting off. In the morning, I woke up to my phone playing some other random video with only 2% of my battery left. I went to work later that morning and as usual, watched some more TikToks on my break. Again, I saw the same video pop up on my feed, the time-lapse child video. I let it play again in the background as I ate my sandwich, not really paying much attention. The end of my shift came and I made my way to my car. Out of the corner of my eye, I thought I saw a child in the road, but as I turned to look, I only saw a bus zooming past, nothing else left on the road. When I got back into bed, I decided to zoom call my sister and her family. She's a little bit older than I am and has a husband and three children. We talked for a bit about what we both have been up to. And then, after a while, one of her kids came into her room, I assume wanting something. My sister, however, just kept on talking, as if she hadn't noticed one of her kids was behind her. After a few moments, I pointed at the screen to indicate to her to look. And as she turned her head, the child was gone. The Zoom call then suddenly quit, and my screen plunged into darkness. I received another call, so I answered it. But this time, it was my sister's room, but without my sister in it. Instead, it was two children, staring into the screen with their mouths wide open, almost as if their jaws were dislocated. Bethany. My name was hissed behind my ear. I shot my head around me, but saw nothing behind me. I turned back around to see my iPad and my screen was blank. I tried calling my sister back, but she wouldn't answer. So I figured she was busy putting her kids back to bed. I browsed some Twitter, Facebook, and then finally a few TikTok videos before drifting off to sleep. I woke up around 3 a.m. to a high-pitched chipmunk song blaring out of my phone speakers. I looked down at my phone and saw the same time-lapse video of the child. The phone then turned black at the same time as my bedroom's light turned on. Staring at me was a child, eyes black and mouth wide open with a dislocated jaw. I tried to speak but my mouth felt numb and dry, as if I'd eaten a teaspoon of cinnamon. The child's eyes sharpened, a small white pupil forming in the middle of his coal black eyes. A blaring white pupil right in my direction. A voice hissed. The lights turned off. Blackness flooded the room as my phone screen turned back on. Video after video of children flashed by my eyes as my TikTok feed automatically played. Each video was a child, staring into the camera. Eyes wide open, jaws dislocated. This time I heard murmuring seemingly coming from these children. At first, it was a whisper. But as each video played after the next, the murmurs became a mumble, then a hiss, then a melody. The audio from the video stopped. Then out of the silence, my phone blared into shouts of incoherent screams. The screams were no longer language known to me, just animalistic guttural cries. In desperation and horror, I threw my phone against the wall. Instead of hearing a crash, I heard a dull thud as it fell straight down onto my rug right in front of the bed. Panic filled my body for a brief second, but then there was nothing. I woke up to the morning sun seeping through my window blinds. I got myself ready for work and made my way to my car, my hands trembling the whole journey. I spoke to one of my colleagues who I knew believed in the supernatural spiritual stuff, and he listened to me intently. After I finished my story, he looked me dead in the eye and told me to get rid of my phone. He told me to stop using social media and to stop watching videos. Before I could ask him why, a customer interrupted us asking for directions for a product they couldn't find. I tried waiting for my colleague after work. I was eager to ask him more. As I leaned against my car door, I saw three children walk towards me. As I began to ask what they wanted, my mouth fell silent as my eyes met theirs. Their eyes were pure black and their mouths dropped open, becoming wider and wider as I heard their jaws open into dislocation. I then felt a hand grip mine and pull me across the car park to another car. Don't look back. Try not to even think about them. My colleague rasped his voice at me. I saw them. I saw those things right in front of you, in your car. I saw their eyes. I looked blankly at my colleague, unable to reply. It's okay, Bethany. You must be in shock. I know who they are. What they are. You mustn't use your phone. You mustn't watch anything else online. They will leave you alone. They will go away. My throat tightens. It's okay. You don't need to say anything. Just go home, eat, and get some rest. 
I'll cover for you tomorrow. I walked away back to my car. My whole body felt stiff and lethargic. As I turned the key into the ignition, I saw the three kids again on the other side of the car. I also saw my colleague kneeling down in front of them, speaking to them. As I drove out, I drove past them, and my colleague looked up at me. His head twisted unnaturally. His eyes were black, and his mouth hung open. I sped off in my car, and I made my way home through different roads and avenues. Every time I turned my head, I saw a child on the sidewalk, eyes black, jaw dislocated. I forced myself to keep looking ahead until I reached my house. I packed some essentials and got back in my car and drove up to my dad's house. This is where I am now. I'm with my dad, in the middle of nowhere. There are no children here, no schools or play parks. I would have stayed off the internet, off of my phone, but I saw one. I still saw a child. There's no escaping them. I understand that now. You must all keep off these video sites. It's the only warning that I can think of that might protect you. To give you some context, I'm a 14 year old girl, and ever since I downloaded TikTok, me and my friends would always make dancing videos for our TikTok accounts. One day, we were hanging out at the mall. And we were all doing a popular TikTok dance at the time in front of my phone that was recording. After we were done, I pick up my phone and watch the TikTok. In the video, I notice a guy in the background. He looked to be about our age, maybe slightly older. Keep in mind, we were in a public setting, so it wasn't uncommon to get stares from people passing by. Though, this guy wasn't walking by. He was more so standing still and sort of blankly staring at us. We all noticed him, and one of my friends jokingly makes fun of him for being creepy. All in all, we thought nothing of it. I looked behind to see if he was still there, but he was gone. A couple weeks go by, and I get a direct message from a guy named Greg on TikTok. The message said, Hey, just noticed I was in your latest TikTok. I feel honored. Curious, I clicked on his profile and noticed that, sure enough, it was the guy who was staring at us in the background of my TikTok video. We sort of went about chatting, and I actually found him pretty funny. A couple days go past, and he asked me for my Snapchat. We text some more in messages, and eventually he asked me to go out to get coffee sometime. He was pretty good looking to be honest, so I accepted. The day comes, and we meet at Starbucks. When I see him, I immediately notice he's extremely nervous. For example, when I asked him how he was doing, he just kind of replied with one word answers, and he kept acting like this for the entire date. I decided to break the ice by telling him he was pretty smooth over text, to which he replies his older brother helps him out with girls, and then he just kind of falls flat again. There were a lot of long silent pauses, and it was kind of starting to get a little awkward for me. I felt bad for him, but at the same time I didn't know what to say. Eventually, he excuses himself to use the restroom. That's when I start to hear faint banging coming from the men's restroom. It was like something banging on the wall over and over. Now, the Starbucks was decently empty, so I'm 90% sure the banging came from him. The banging then stopped, and a couple minutes later, Greg comes out. I noticed his forehead was red. Was he banging his head against the wall? That's when I decide something's off about him. I tell him I need to head home, and made up some dumb excuse. We told each other goodbye, and I left. As soon as I get home and get on my phone, I see a bunch of notifications coming from TikTok. So, I open the app and see that he's liked all of my TikTok posts. All the likes came from about 30 minutes ago, meaning he was probably liking my pictures when he was in the restroom, given that I didn't see him on his phone when he was with me. This creeps me out. I don't know what to think. Then, I open my messages on Snapchat, and he tells me he had a really great time talking to me. This was obviously out of place for him to say, because he barely said a word. Something was definitely fishy about this whole thing. The way he was texting did not match how he was in real life. Either he's just super shy in person, or his brother is giving all the hints on how to text. I decide to leave him on red. Immediately after though, he messages me, asking if I had just left him on red. I decided not to open the message so as not to escalate things, but that's when things got disturbing. A couple minutes later, I get a strange message from him saying, Why are you making me do this? I instantly replied to this message, asking him doing what, and if he was okay. From that, I didn't get any response from Greg anymore. At this point, I was a little concerned. I was thinking back to the fact that he might have been banging his head out of frustration when we were at Starbucks. I decided to call him, but no answer. I had no way of reaching him, and I didn't know where he lived, so I was stuck. 
I regret leaving him on red, but figured he's probably fine and just doing this to get a response. The message was also ambiguous, so it was unclear whether he implied self-harm or not. Either way, there was nothing I could do to reach him, so I just decided to let it go and hopefully wait for a response the day after. The next morning, I checked Snapchat and noticed he had left me on red. I was relieved now that he was either over me leaving him on red or just making a point. A couple weeks passed and things were pretty uneventful. That was until one night. It was around 11pm and I was staying up late studying in my room. I was really thirsty so I decided to go downstairs to get some water. As I'm in the kitchen, I get my drink and get ready to head back up the stairs. That's when I hear a chair move from outside the deck. It's a noise I recognize because I hear it all the time when my parents are moving the outside deck chairs. But this time, it was really sudden and loud. I decided to go investigate, as maybe a deer or something hit one of the chairs and were making their way in my backyard. I open the sliding glass door to the deck area and look around. It's pitch black, so I can barely make out the chairs. I decided to turn on the lights, and that's when I see it. It was Greg's face hidden in the bushes. I get a mini heart attack, but in the moment I somehow froze and sort of looked to the side so that he didn't notice me realize he was there hiding. I look around for a couple more seconds to make it seem like I didn't see anything unusual before turning the lights back off, going back inside and locking the door behind me. I somehow managed to make it look like I calmly got my drink from the kitchen counter and went back to my room. I lock my bedroom door and immediately call 911. The operator tells me that they'll send a police car on the way. I know all the doors downstairs are locked, but just in case while I'm waiting, I try to listen as carefully as I can to any noise coming from outside or downstairs. Minutes later, I could hear police sirens. They were able to find Greg. Upon talking with them, they said they found him in the backyard trying to escape by climbing the fence before getting tased for not cooperating with the cops. He was apparently placed in some sort of mental institution to get help. I'm glad Greg now receives the help he needs, but most importantly that me and my family made it out safe as I'm convinced Greg didn't have good intentions that night. When your guts tell you to get out, listen to it. Have you ever had someone you were close with change suddenly? Almost as if they were a completely different person? That's exactly what happened to my parents when I got back from college last year from summer break. My parents were usually a bit distant, but they always made sure to keep in contact with me when I left for each semester, as we were still pretty close otherwise. When it neared the end of that semester, they didn't call or message me as they usually did. It was weird, but nothing suspicious or out of the ordinary. I assume that they probably just had a lot going on at work. That is, until I got home that summer. The front lawn was extremely overgrown and getting really dark and browning, which was something my father would rarely let happen. He was a gardener after all. He wouldn't be caught dead with an ugly, disgraceful lawn. On top of that, the potted flowers near the front door were all wilted and dying. Once I'd gotten inside my childhood home, it felt so off that it didn't even feel like it was my home at all. So much so that I leaned back out from the door to check the address once more, just in case. It was the right address, but it didn't feel like it. It didn't feel as welcoming as it once did when I got home. There was no scent of lavender filling the air from mom's candles. She had lit almost 24-7. The once comforting and calm forest surroundings felt almost eerie and unwanting of my presence. My six-year-old tabby cat hadn't welcomed me the moment I opened the door, and neither had my parents. Mom? Dad? I shouted. I'm back! I shouted, hoping for some sort of reply as my voice echoed throughout the seemingly empty house. The entire kitchen and living room was very neat, as if nobody really used anything, or it was just a stage room used in a furniture store. For just a moment, a feeling deep within my gut telling me to leave began to radiate throughout my body, but I quickly shoved it away. Besides, this was the home I grew up in. It was a safe place. At least a minute or two after I had called out to my parents, they both walked through the hallway towards the kitchen in unison. The instant I saw them, it caused me to jump out of my skin slightly, as they hadn't made a single sound as they walked over. 
Usually I would hear the creaks within the floorboards or the scraping of my mother's wooden chair upstairs in her office. Once they saw me with my heart racing against my chest violently, they smiled at me, but it wasn't their usual sweet and caring ones. It almost made me feel a weird, unsettling feeling, almost like if you saw a random man smiling at you from an alley in the dark in the night. Just, it caused the gut feeling to simmer within me once more. We've been waiting for you, dear. My mother said in a sickly sweet voice that made me inwardly cringe. My parents never called me nicknames. They always used my full name. My mother had never talked to me as if I were a child. Even when I was a child. All of it was unnerving and overloading my senses. It was too much for me to unpack and handle after a five hour trip from my college campus. I told them I was tired and just wanted to go rest for a bit. They hadn't even replied to my statement. From what I can recall, they simply stepped backwards to make room for me to walk past them, their stare never faltering from me, not even to blink. I felt their burning glare bore holes into my back as I made my way down the hallway and up the stairs. I felt as if they were still on me even when I wasn't around them in my own room. I was tired enough to just toss my luggage beside my bed, crawl under the covers and pass out without another thought of how out of place everything felt. I woke up to complete darkness surrounding me. The only light came from the hall. As I tried my best to gain some semblance of sight within the dark, I sensed the scorching feeling of eyes burning into me. The moment I glanced towards my doorway, I almost leapt from my bed as I saw a black figure standing within my doorframe. Another dark figure caught my eye, standing in the corner of my room. Maybe it was the darkness that made it all so unsettling, or maybe it was the fact that deep down, I knew the people in my room weren't my parents. They just didn't have the same professional, yet caring aura that always radiated from within them. Instead, they felt hostile and dangerous. It's, it was almost like how you would feel if you fell into the cage of a predatory zoo animal. I'm not sure how long I even laid there, letting the oddly heavy sounds of my parents breathing fill the room uncomfortably. I only realized I had been holding my breath once I tried to speak. The sound that came out was simply just a gasp for air. But the moment it came from my mouth, the shadow in the corner of my eye, it stood in my room, began making its way towards me slowly. Its movements were excruciatingly slow, causing the floorboards creak to draw out longer than they should. Darling, should you not be sleeping? The shadow nearing me spoke. It was my mother's voice, but it also wasn't. It was laced with some malintent and an overbearing sense of false sweetness. Midnight is waiting for you. We want to take you to him, said the shadow still standing like stone in my doorway. Midnight was the name of my cat, the cat I hadn't seen once since I'd been home, which would have been one of the weirder things if it wasn't for my parents being more so. She was being a bad cat, so we had to punish her, stated my father seriously. His words caused my heart to plummet, deeply into my stomach at his implication. Get rid of her, growled my mother, a wicked grin slowly pulling the corners of her lips. Now you'll join her, spat my father as he began to lunge for me, his mouth spread open wider than humanly possible. I could easily fit inside it in one gulp, not touching a single sharpened tooth that laid within his mouth. I quickly moved aside clumsily knocking into the wall, hitting my head harshly. My action caused my father to fall onto my bed, letting out a deep and horrid scream of rage. The sound was something that could make even the most hardened person's blood run ice cold. The way it echoed in the small room and bounced off the walls rattled my bones. It was enough to make me rush towards my mother who now stood near the doorway, pushing her as hard as I could aside. She apparently wasn't expecting me to do such a thing as she tumbled over into my dresser causing everything to fall over with her. I pumped my legs with vigor as I ran down the stairs fast enough for me to almost trip down them. The moment I reached the landing of the first floor, an almost unbearable scent consumed the once tense air. The smell was almost rotten, but it was even more disgusting and indescribable than that. When I thought back to when I came home, I didn't remember smelling anything close to that. If I did, I would have easily remembered it, even if I didn't want to. I could hear both of my parents' footsteps heavily dragging against the floorboards above. They began talking in sync, their voices deep and wrapped in an utterly unsettling manner. 
We love you. We need you. Come here, darling. They said together as they continued their way towards the stairs slowly. Their voices seemed to fill the entire house, bellowing against every wall no matter how far away they were. I just sprinted towards the door, their footsteps beckoning sharp creaks from the staircase, and their almost mocking voices continuing relentlessly. The moment I tried the door handle, I heard their footsteps quicken down the stairs. That's, That's not, not where, where midnight, midnight is. is. That's, That's not, not where midnight, midnight is. is. She's, She's within, within us, us now, and you will be too. They shouted darkly in unison, their pounding footsteps taunting my ears cruelly. The door was locked. They locked the door, and I didn't have a key. I never thought the old doorknob that needed a key to lock the outside and inside was stupid and odd until that moment. There was no way a stupidly made door was going to get me killed. As soon as the idea of just breaking through the window filled my mind, I felt my entire body being pushed with immense power across the room and over the kitchen counter. The pain that filled me was intense, so intense enough to trick me into truly believing that I broke every bone within my small body. I could hear their laugh slamming against my ringing ears as they grew closer to me. I tried as hard as I could to break out of my pain-induced doze slowly getting up to get my bearings, just to see how hard I had to fight and run to get to my escape. Tasty thing, offered my mother. As soon as I locked eyes with her, I knew for sure she wasn't who she seemed to be. The hunger that flowed within her dark eyes were impossible to miss. The way she looked at me like a new meal as she licked her lips, smiling. Once they got close enough to me, but not close enough to grab, I crawled a bit and then pushed myself up with all the strength I had left to race for my exit. Their horrific screams of anger filled my ears once again, their feet slamming against the floor quickly now. Once I felt seething pain against my scalp and a feeling of vicious hands pulling at my hair, I kicked the assaulter behind me. The moment my foot made contact with their stomach, a manly grunt came from them, causing them to let go of my locks. I took my well-earned chance. Grabbing the stone statue of a horse that sat on the table beside the window, I smashed the statue against the thin glass, tossing it through as the pane shattered. I didn't even think about the leftover glass shards still sticking out from the window as I pushed myself through. I felt glass pierce the delicate skin against my feet and hands, but I didn't care. I just ran. I ran as hard and as fast as I could, leaving my luggage and my car behind me. I didn't dare look behind me once as the ominous, corrupted sounds of my parents shouting threats at me filled the night's air. I may have been extremely close with my family all my life. I never contacted them again. I called the police on them, mostly hoping that they would be able to get them the help they desperately needed to calm them down. I'm not sure if the news I got from the police officers was comforting, upsetting, or just disgusting. Because once they entered my parents' home, they found both of them dead in the basement. They told me that it was estimated they had been there for over a month. Once they told me the news, I knew for sure whoever those people were, were not my parents. It's been a year and I'm finishing my last semester of college. I still have nightmares and sometimes I even think I see them hiding in the trees when I'm taking runs on the hiking trails near campus. If you ever have a gut feeling that something is immensely off, listen to it. It knows better than you ever could or else you may not get the chance I did to escape the consequences. So I encountered my stalker when I was a freshman in high school. It first started off from something as extremely harmless to downright disturbing. After my first day of school, a girl named Alexa had added me on Snapchat. I thought nothing of it since I didn't know her like that. She started hitting me up, but I didn't like her in that way. One day after school, I was walking home and she randomly informed me that she added me to her private story. Okay, so I never asked her about it. I got home and out of curiosity I checked her private story. What I saw definitely weirded me out. Her story was a video of me walking home, particularly not too far away from my house. The caption of the video said, kiss me already. Did she want me to just turn around as soon as I saw her story and give her a kiss? I don't know. How did I not know she was behind me that whole time? Whatever. I got over it quickly though, since I thought she was no threat. 
just a creepy harmless girl with an obsession for me. I should have blocked her, but anyways, one day I misplaced my sweater. I checked all my previous classes I had and especially the lost and found. I eventually gave up because there were no signs of it being anywhere. I eventually bumped into Alexa one day during random lunch period at the water fountain. This was one of the most socially awkward interactions I've ever had with someone. Seeing her for the first time in person, something about her gave me this really creepy vibe. No offense. I then noticed that she was wearing my sweater, but I pretended that I didn't realize. She must have stolen it when I wasn't paying attention, obviously. She didn't say anything at first, so I felt really uncomfortable during this brief moment of silence. She then broke the ice by asking me in this emotionless stare, do you want to hang out later? I excused myself from this creepy conversation by saying that I needed to use the bathroom. She gave me this annoyed look as I walked away from her. I was relieved that it was over. I stopped opening her snaps from that day on and avoiding her at all costs. Fast forward a month or two into the school year. Me and my good friend E, we were planning on throwing a party in his basement. It was just another one of those typical high school parties. But me and E made sure that no private information gets revealed about our party to no one. Really the address. We didn't want any random unwanted guests to come over. That was a big no-no. So E gave me the approval for letting me post on my Snapchat story that there was a party going on tonight. I saw that Alexa immediately responded in the first 30 seconds and I saw the notification that she had sent a message. I knew she was asking to come. So I never responded back knowing that she was, you know, pretty weird. Party commenced that night and I was having a lot of fun. And all of a sudden I heard this commotion going on in the other room. Out of curiosity, I looked in there and I saw E. He was shouting at Alexa and her two other weird friends. Alexa then noticed me and gave me this hideous stare. She walked up to me ready to fight me and then started screaming profusely at me. She threw a tantrum about why I didn't answer her snaps and how I didn't want her to come. She was throwing a full on fit in front of everyone. She was having a mental breakdown for another two minutes until she finally stormed out. After the party, me and E later figured out that she had snuck through an unlocked back door and she snuck into his bedroom and stole a Snickers. I removed that freak from my Snapchat that night. E didn't tell his parents about Alexa because he didn't want to get in trouble for throwing a party. I really didn't know how she figured out the address because I remember that me and E told everyone at the party to leave their snap maps off so nobody could see the location of the party. After that awful weekend, I was sick of Alexa and her following me everywhere I went. I realized that she was nuts. I marched up to Alexa first thing at school and gave her a piece of my mind. She probably understood since I never saw her again, but it wouldn't be the last time. By that next week, she left my school, never to be heard from again. On a Christmas day, I received a text from an unknown number. She introduced herself as Alexa's aunt. Alexa's aunt said that Alexa ran away recently and to contact this number. Was this a sympathetic way for Alexa to start talking to me again? It was pretty weird knowing that her aunt had my number. I asked a group of my friends if they also got this strange text message. They all said yes. One of my friends said that apparently she does hard drugs now and that she sleeps on the streets. Another friend said there was a rumor she wanted to fight me, which I found kind of funny. I didn't believe her for some reason because she looked genuinely innocent. Boy, was I wrong. Fast forward many months later. I don't know if it was just a coincidence, but this girl definitely found me. Me and my two close female friends at the time were hanging out one Friday. They begged me to go to this popular fast food joint so we can get some snacks. It was nearby and many kids would gather there to hang out around this time. I hesitated for a bit because there is usually a weird crowd there as well. We started walking and made it there in five minutes. We were right in front of the entrance when two sketchy guys in dark hoods quickly approached us. They reeked of marijuana and asked me if I wanted to buy some. I couldn't see their face in the dark. They both had low voices and were significantly taller than me. I declined their offer because I knew that they could have attempted to mug me or just jump me in the parking lot. We went inside. 
My two female friends made their order, and we found a seat. Two minutes later, I saw that Alexa had just entered the restaurant with the same two guys. I got red flags immediately, realizing that one of the guys was dating Alexa, and this might be a setup. They were intently staring at us from a distance. We had to leave now, and I told one of my female friends to text their parents for a ride right now. She didn't hesitate because she also saw them too. Alexa was already creepy, but the menacing look she was giving us was nightmare fuel. Something really didn't feel right. Something bad was about to happen. In the span of 10 seconds, Alexa was at the table, picking a fight with my two friends. My friends were both scared as hell and couldn't defend themselves, so I had to intervene and tell her to get away. She didn't put her attention toward me. She was screaming a bunch of things that a deranged person with ill intentions would say. She was right in my face, and I could see that her eyes were bloodshot red. She might have been on something. She then called the other two guys, probably to back her up. Those two guys were just as hideous as Alexa was, being that I could fully see their faces now. Her apparent boyfriend started talking to me. He told me if I ran out that he would stab me. He then showed me that he was armed with a blade. And now the tension really began to rise in the room. I was scared as hell, since I was outnumbered and they were both armed. No one was backing us up at all. Everyone was just silently staring at us. The employees were either too afraid to approach us or were oblivious to what was going on. The boyfriend was demanding me for my phone and any other valuables that I had on me. Meanwhile, Alexa and the other guy were making my two friends frozen in fear. I felt that I was put into a very dangerous situation. I've always been a passive person who would never desire to get my hands dirty, but I knew how to perform jujitsu. I tried to keep my cool as long as I could. I was waiting for the ride to get there so we can get the hell out of there. It felt like an eternity. These misfortunate teenagers were really underestimating me. Then Alexa's boyfriend said something disrespectful, very disrespectful, and that's when I snapped. I lunged at both of them and ended up breaking the boyfriend's nose. It started a massive commotion inside the restaurant. Every other kid surrounding us had recorded the brawl, even that freak Alexa. Alexa was screaming for her boyfriend to beat me up. The employees finally broke us up and told us all to leave. In that quick moment, my girlfriends ushered me out of the building. One of their moms had come to pick us up. As we sprinted to the car, I turned around to see that Alexa and the two guys were behind us. This was the most gut-riching feeling I ever felt because they were armed with blades. Before I slammed the car door, the boyfriend tried to pull me out. That's when I kicked him in his jaw a few times and he fell to the ground. We sped off into the night. My two friends beside me were now sobbing and uncontrollably. Meanwhile, the mom was frantically asking me what was happening. I was the only one who responded by telling her everything. The mom later said that it was mandatory that I sleep at her house. She didn't want me walking home alone in the dark that night. I just wondered why she didn't just take me home. I really just wanted to go home at this point. We made it to my friend's house and as soon as we went into the living room, my phone started to vibrate. It was my good friend so I picked up the phone. I put him on loudspeaker so my other friends can hear as well. On that phone call he dropped a bomb. Earlier in the evening, Alexa and the two guys attempted to break into his house. They were banging on the front door, screaming at him to open it up. He ran and told his parents that there were intruders trying to break in. The kids booked it as soon as the parents informed him that the police were on their way. He also told me that Alexa was outside my house right after that incident. I asked him what he meant. He then sent me a disturbing video from Alexa's Snapchat story. In the video, Alexa was outside of my house with even more people than before. She then eerily said, where is he? This wasn't over yet. I felt relieved that I didn't go back home that night. Somehow, my family didn't know that they were outside the house that whole time. The next few days were the most anxiety filled days of my life. I started to receive threatening messages every minute from unknown contact. I knew it was them. They said that they will find me either at my house or at my school. Feeling that I was still in danger, I told my parents everything. They scheduled an appointment with two police officers so I could report the incident to them. 
I screenshotted several of the text messages sent by several contacts. My mom would also start getting those phone calls from the same contacts. They said a bunch of crazy stuff to her that I couldn't tell you. I realized how deranged and mentally ill Alexa was after all of this. This is extremely abnormal behavior from a teenager. It was like she wanted to kill me or something. A week later of being paranoid from that incident, I was at school. We had a substitute teacher and nothing was really going on. It was the last five minutes of that last period and everyone was getting antsy in their seats. This class was in the basement of my school and I was sitting beside one of my friends who were there that night with me. The basement of our school was very creepy and narrow. My class was located at the very end of a long, eerie, dark hallway. My friend then asked to use the bathroom, and once she came back a minute later, she looked frightened. It was almost like she had that same face from that one night. She calmly sat down beside me and whispered in my ear, they're here. I asked where. She responded at the end of the hallway. I checked to see if she was telling the truth, so I cracked the door open. What happened next felt like a horror movie. Alexa was at the end of the hallway, but she wasn't alone. My heart dropped to my stomach when I saw her. She was already looking in my direction and our eyes locked up to each other's. She was with two boys I fought earlier and three other sketchy guys. Why didn't the hallway monitor kick them out? I don't know. I quickly shut the door feeling the same dreadful feeling that I had that night and that I was a dead man after school. The bell rang at the consecutive moment. Class was over. As I left my class, I saw that Alexa and her goons were slowly creeping toward me. And that is when I booked it out of there out the exit. I lost them as soon as I left the school property. That night, my parents broke the news to me that Alexa and her boyfriend were just arrested, pulling off another act in a fast food joint. The employees were apparently afraid of them. Apparently. They were both common customers around that time of night. This time, they were caught for good. I had been with my girlfriend for a few years when this happened, and we decided to move in together. We lived on the second floor of an apartment building. I'm going to get straight to the point. One night at around midnight, or a little bit past midnight, I could hear someone outside near a shack in our back parking lot. While sitting at my desktop computer, I can hear something. I look outside, but I didn't see anything. I turned off my light. And I heard the sound again. I looked out. Then I looked down near the shack. And to my shock, I saw a man looking right at me. He was standing right next to the shack. I really wasn't afraid due to people possibly smoking back there. But it was pretty late. So I just went back to what I was doing. About 20 minutes later, I happened to look back out there. He was still there in the same spot looking right at me. I said whatever and I went to bed. The next day around the same time, I hear I said this can't be happening and I looked outside and it was the same person doing the same thing. I called one of my friends and he thought it was funny. But the guy stood there for hours. I decided not to do anything. But I told my girlfriend the next morning and she was freaked out. So that next morning, I looked out there again, but no one was there. At least not yet. At around 1.30 a.m., I look outside, and guess who was there? That same guy. I recorded some of it and made sure that my girlfriend was up to see this. And this is what I caught on camera. It's uh, 2.49 a.m., and this guy's been out here for like an hour now, and the cops still haven't showed up, so I just called again. So I guess we'll wait and see if they show this time. Uh, In the meantime, I'm going to film it to keep this as a record of what's been going on. So this guy's been out here uh, for the past three nights now. Um, And it's like I kind of didn't really pay that much attention to him before because sometimes people go back there like to talk on their phone or um, like smoke a cigarette, I guess, late at night. but this guy's just been out there staring and I didn't really pay much mind until I noticed that he was in the same kind of same area um, every night 
and he was not moving, just staring at our window. And I could see him when I'm on my computer. So, yeah, um, I'm going to record this and keep a record as, I guess, video evidence because cops never showed up. After that night, he showed up a few more times, but I wasn't really worried because I bought a weapon. Still to this day, I haven't seen this guy anymore. I don't know what that was for and what his deal was, but it didn't really scare me. It was just kind of weird. I don't know. I am a school resource officer in the city of Austin, Texas. Last year, my buddy and I were working graveyard shift and got a call to the campus because an alarm had been triggered. My partner and I went to the campus and went to a hallway where rooms 143 and 144 were located. After clearing the area, I told my buddy that I was going to the restroom and for him to wait for me. When I came out, my buddy signals with his hand to be quiet and listen. I noticed he had his gun drawn, so I drew mine too. I listened to the silence, and we both heard what sounded like shuffling, or something being dragged through the floor. I thought to myself, oh shoot, and I told my partner, there's someone here. We canvassed through the entire campus this time, and again, we saw nothing. Afterward, we came back to the same spot and I told my partner to head out. He agreed and stated, It's raccoons on the ceiling making the noises. He then banged in the wall, and we quickly got a reply in the far distance with another bang. My partner and I headed out in a bit in a hurry, since we knew that the campus was empty. When we headed outside, we heard screeching on top of our heads. Clear screeching, but never could determine where it came from. When we got back onto our patrol car, we asked ourselves, who would know anything or the particulars about this campus? My partner mentioned that another officer I was very familiar with, he knew the history of the campus, so we called him since he was the only one on duty anyway. When we called the third officer, all we asked was, do you know about this campus? He said, oh yeah, it's haunted. The haunted area is between rooms 143 and 144. My partner and I looked at each other in amazement. The third officer went on to say that he had a video of it. Without further ado, here's the video he provided. Keep in mind, when we received this video, everything was consistent with the noises we heard that night. And that video was uploaded by the third officer a year prior to this night. My very good friend Felicia got married in December of last year. I was one of her bridesmaids, and we had a bachelorette weekend at Daytona Beach, Florida, about a month before the wedding. There were eight of us in total. Myself, Felicia, Andrea, Lorena, Julia, Renee, Caitlin, and Brittany. We rented a house off of Airbnb that was less than a mile away from the beach. The price that we got it for was almost too good to be true. When we got there, the place wasn't what we were expecting. That's not to say it was a complete dump. It did have a charm to it, but there was just something off about it. For one, it had a basement, which is incredibly rare to find in Florida. Down in the basement, there were two rooms connected by an archway. There also appeared to be several rushed renovations done throughout the home. Something that struck me as odd was that there was a space under the staircase that was 
fenced off. It was very bizarre to be staring at a literal chain link fence inside of a basement in Florida. But we figured it had something to do with the recent renovations and moved along. So the first day we spent shopping around town. That evening we went out for dinner, then went bar hopping afterwards. We didn't get back until around 1am. We had all drank a considerable amount that night, so we didn't stay up and hang out. We just decided to call it a night and get ready for bed. Felicia and I slept in the same bed in the first section of the basement. Through the archway is where Andrea and Lorena slept. They pushed two twin beds together. Everyone else slept upstairs. So about two hours after everyone fell asleep, I randomly woke up and turned to my side and I see the silhouette of someone moving silently past the bed, towards the archway, where Lorena and Andrea were sleeping. The only thing that was providing any kind of light was from a streetlight outside coming through a small window, so I couldn't make out many details, but I could clearly see that whoever this person was, was wearing a baseball cap. Now I had made the entire bridal party caps on my cricket machine, and handed them out to everyone when we first got there. So my first thought was that either Lorena or Andrea had gotten up to use the restroom, but then I thought about how strange it was that they would be wearing one of the caps I made them. Without a sound, the figure disappeared through the archway, and shortly after, I saw these brief flashes of light coming from the other room. It was almost as if someone was taking pictures. I began to internally freak out, I was thinking that someone was down there with us and was taking pictures of Andrea and Lorena while they slept. Felicia is a light sleeper, so I squeezed her hand to wake her up. As soon as her eyes opened, I whispered to her that I thought someone was in the house and that there were flashes coming from the other room. Felicia was the closest to the archway, so she got up and grabbed her phone off the dresser, which was on the far side of the basement and peered into the other room with her cell phone. She climbed back into bed and told me that there was nobody there and that Andrea and Lorena were fast asleep. I was confused. I swear that I saw someone wearing a baseball cap walk into that room. I thought that maybe since I was in a new place, I might have been just seeing things and was overreacting. I eventually fell back asleep and I tried to put the strange incident out of my mind and enjoy the rest of the trip. The next day we spent on the beach and even went axe throwing later on. We got back in at around 10 p.m. We popped in a movie and chilled out for the rest of that night. We all fell asleep around midnight. About an hour after I fell asleep next to Felicia in the basement, we were all woken up by a loud scream coming from the next room. We then heard Lorena shouting. Are you guys fucking with me? We got up and went into the room to see what was going on. We found out that Lorena had not been sleeping and was just lying in her bed listening to her headphones. She turns over and sees a man wearing jeans and a jacket and of course, a baseball cap. He was apparently standing next to her bed facing the wall and was smiling. That's when she closed her eyes tight, and when she looked again, the man was gone. And that's when she started screaming. Everyone who was sleeping in the basement started to gather their things, and it was decided that we would all sleep upstairs. However, with all of us being thoroughly freaked out and wide awake, and had to leave early the next day anyways, we decided just to get the hell out of there and I drove the two and a half hours back to my place that night. Later on, Felicia decided to look up the history of the house we stayed in. What was odd is that since its construction in the 1920s, it has changed owners several times over the years. Nobody ever lived there for more than five years at most. Felicia did inform the owner of the house what happened, but the owner just brushed it off saying that they never heard of anyone having that kind of experience there before. But strangely, when we tried to look up the house to see if it was still available, the listing was completely gone from the website. If it had just been me who saw the man in the baseball cap, 
I might have been able to dismiss this whole thing. But Lorena saw him as well, and he seemed to vanish into thin air after he appeared. I'm convinced that we all experienced something paranormal at that house. I'm not supposed to tell anyone this. It all started this past November. I had a major job interview in Toronto at a graphic design firm. They needed me in the city for a few days, as there were two training sessions I had to attend along with this interview. Because I live in Niagara, about a two-hour drive away, I decided that it would just be wise to just stay at a hotel so I wouldn't have to drive back and forth every day. About a week before the interview, I was at my boyfriend's house looking online for relatively cheap hotels that were close to the graphic design firm. He brought up that I should go on a website called Airbnb, which is an online trusted marketplace where guests can book spaces from hosts like apartments or houses. I ended up finding a woman who was going on vacation for about a week during the exact time I was supposed to be in Toronto. She was renting out her apartment for $50 a night, which I thought was very generous. I ended up giving her a call and arranged the time I would be coming over. The apartment building was very run down. The windows looked like they hadn't been cleaned in years, and the brick walls were crumbling and discolored. I took a deep breath and considered telling the woman that my interview was cancelled so that I could find somewhere else to stay, but $50 a night seemed so perfect compared to hundreds of dollars a night at a hotel. I decided that I would at least check out the room before making the judgment. I knocked on the old wooden door with the number 14 painted in gold and waited a few moments before the woman swung it open and greeted me with a smile. She was a lot younger than I expected, maybe in her late 20s. Her voice sounded so tired and ragged on the phone, I thought she was at least going to be 50. Her blonde hair was tied in a messy bun that paired quite perfectly with her blue tracksuit with a small hole in the shoulder. You made it, she exclaimed. Come in, come in. She gestured into the room, which I am relieved to say was very clean and welcoming. It was definitely one of those don't judge a book by its cover moments. I've always hated that saying, by the way. Heard it too often as a kid. She gave me the quickest tour of an apartment that I had ever received. Briefly pointing to the kitchen, bedroom, bathroom, and hallway closet. It was a small space, but perfect for me. Her place was filled with vintage collectibles. Lace. Elaborate curtains. Old candle holders. I was still examining my surroundings when she erupted with. So you're all set then. I'm gonna go. I barely had any time to speak with her. She seemed to be in a huge rush. Wait, I said, trying to catch up to her as she made her way out the door carrying a large backpack. Is there anything I should know? She shook her head slowly, locking eyes with me for a few moments too long. Without speaking, she left. I made myself comfortable for a little while, unpacking and fixing myself a quick snack in the kitchen. I had about 45 minutes before I had to leave for my interview. I'll skip past the details of the interview because they aren't even nearly as important as the occurrence that happened afterward. It was very late when I got back. The apartment building was pitch black except for a small light at the top of the staircase that flickered every few seconds. I used the light from my phone to make my way up the stairs to my apartment. 14. I wondered who else was living in the building. I hadn't seen anyone since I arrived. It was too quiet. It took me a few moments to find the light switch on the wall when I entered the room. From the doorway, I was able to see into the bedroom. The first thing I noticed was that a few of my clothes were sprawled over the floor. I quickly kicked off my shoes and approached the mess. I came to the conclusion that I must have been in a rush when I was getting ready for the interview and forgot to clean up. I was tired, so I had a quick shower and jumped into bed. The mattress wasn't very comfortable, but I was so exhausted that I drifted right into sleep. A loud shuffling somewhere in the apartment woke me up with a startle. I sat up and squinted my eyes to try to see through the darkness. Just before I was able to lay back down to sleep, thinking it was one of my neighbors in their apartment, I saw a shape. At first I thought it was one of the woman's elaborate curtains playing tricks on my eyes in the dark. Then it moved, just ever so slightly. The black shape was tall and lanky. It almost resembled a man. But it was just too hard to see. I inched my arm for the light switch, my heart pounding out of my chest. Just before the light flickered on, the figure fell on all floors and crawled inhumanly out of sight. What the fuck? I couldn't help but whisper. With the light now on, I got up and slowly made my way around the apartment trying to find out what I just saw. But there was nothing. Absolutely nothing. Without anything else I could do, I went back to bed. There must have been a logical explanation for what had happened. It was all in my head. In the morning, I called the woman. 
I must have sounded so strange when I asked her if she had anyone else that lived with her that maybe could come into the room last night, not expecting me to be there. She paused for a while and then answered with no and insisted she was busy and had to go. I proceeded with my day going to my first training session. When I came back that night, I felt extra cautious. I brought a knife with me to bed, placing it under my pillow. I was woken up once again about 2 a.m. This time, the figure was much closer than it was the previous night. I gasped, so filled with fright that I couldn't move or scream. The figure was so skinny. Through the shadows, I could almost make out the rib cage underneath its skin. It was naked. Its face lingered in the dark except for two dark circles, where his eyes must have been. I tried to scream once again, but it came out like a loud choke. Whatever this was, it reached its finger up to its mouth with a soft shh. The sound was so haunting, it sent a shiver down my neck. Shh. Don't tell. I must have been in such a shock that I passed out because when I woke up, it was morning. All I could do was cry. I was so confused. I had never been more scared in my life. It, it couldn't be real. I was brought up my whole life not to believe in such things. But what if it was actually a disfigured man? Or what if it was something I only heard of in nightmares? I shook my head to rid the craziness. I was probably having nightmares because of all the stress. I left for my second training session. When I came back to the apartment around 10 p.m., I couldn't help but linger outside the door. I stared at the large number 14 painted on the door, trying to find the courage to lift my key out of my pocket, to open it. I told myself that all I had to do was last one more night, and I'd be gone in the morning. I decided to sleep on the couch in the front room this time. This way, I was even closer to the front door, so I could hear it opening if this thing decided to greet me again. It took me a long time to fall asleep. I watched 12 a.m., 1 a.m., 2 a.m., and 3 a.m. go by on the clock. I must have dozed off because I woke up from a cold breeze. It was 3.47. I sat up on the couch to see that the window was open, making the curtains sway in the winds. As I got up to go close it, ready to call the police, I heard the soft shh behind me. I closed my eyes and started to cry. Shh. It got louder and louder. I slowly turned around to face this creature. It was crouched by the TV just a few feet away from me. It didn't move. It just kept its finger up to its lips. I feared that if I reached for my phone to call the cops, it would come straight for me. Please, I whispered. It was all I could manage to get out. Shh. Don't tell, it said. And the scariest thing since the first time I had seen this thing was that it started to smile. It was smiling. Although it was dark, I could see the shadowed smile that hasn't left my mind in all the months that have passed. I remained completely still, and it stayed there for a few more minutes before it crawled back past the couch and onto the windowsill, looking at me one more time before jumping out. I jolted for my phone and called my boyfriend. I told him everything. I was surprised he even understood me because I was such a mess. Sh should I call the police? I asked frantically. The police won't believe what you were saying. It's hard for me to even comprehend. I think you need to come home. You sound sleep deprived, and I think it's making you see things. My heart sunk. Even my own boyfriend didn't believe me. It smiled at me, I whispered. I heard him sigh before saying goodnight and hanging up the phone. I curled myself into a ball onto the couch and attempted to sleep, but I didn't. How could I after that? As soon as the sun came up, I packed my things and bolted for the door. I had tried calling my boyfriend six times to tell him I was on my way home. No answer. As I opened the door, I bumped right into the woman. She was back early. I didn't even know what to tell her when she asked how my stay was. Look, I have to go. My boyfriend isn't answering his phone, and I need to get home. I pushed her aside without thinking, just wanting to get to my car. Why isn't he answering? She asked with concern in her voice. I wasn't sure why she cared. I shrugged and continued down the stairs. I could see my car through the window on the bottom floor. I was so close to escaping. Did you tell? I heard her say softly from her room. You told, didn't you?